Good evening and welcome to Speech Night. My name is Adi Goldman. I'm president of the MJC's forensics team. What we're going to do for you tonight is just showcase some of the things that we do on our regular competitions and the things that I'm sure some of you are learning about in classes. What I'm going to do is my first duty as mistress of ceremonies and it is introduce you to our head coach, Dr. Charles Ewing. Thank you and welcome to Speech Night, Spring Semester 1998. I hope you enjoy the performances tonight and I also hope that you learn something. You'll be seeing the kinds of speeches that our team does in competition and some of the kinds of speeches that you will be doing in your speech classes. So we're providing some examples for you. One thing I'd like to talk about before that happens though is what forensic means because I have people asking me all the time, do you cut up cadavers like Quincy on television? No, we don't. The word forensic means literally of matters to be adjudicated, meaning placed before a judge who renders a decision. So we have such things as forensic ballistics, which studies bullets and ammunition and things like that. And there is forensic medicine, which Quincy practices, and he finds evidence to bring to court before a judge. And on the speech team, we practice forensic oratory. Our speakers in individual events compete in panels of five or six in preliminary rounds. And a judge, an expert speech faculty member or a veteran competitor, graduate student, listens to them speak, rates them, and ranks them first best of the panel, second best, and so on. They do three preliminary rounds of competition and then from their scores we choose the top six to go to final rounds of competition. And then they get either finalist trophies or third, second, and first place trophies. And when they go into a debate competition, they speak before a judge who renders a decision as to who wins the debate. And that's why it's called forensic speech. So no, we don't cut up cadavers. Now, this campus has one of the most distinguished histories of forensic speech competition of any school in California or the nation. In my office I have a poster that was circulated around town from 1926 and it reads, University of California Berkeley freshman debating MJC debaters and the topic was resolved that the United States should adopt a parliamentary style debate. That was in the high school auditorium and mission 25 cents. They used to raise money that way. Uh, that history goes back to that decade and in the next decade there was a professor here named Oscar Smith who held not one but two PhDs and before he retired he was about to finish his third and he was the forensic speech coach. During the middle 30s, the California Debate League, which governed all competitive speaking, decided to eliminate the judge's decision from debates. Students would gather for a tournament, the judges would listen to the debate, and then do a critique of the debate, but never tell them who won the debate. And that's because for the six years previous, under the coaching of Dr. Smith, MJC's debaters had not lost one single debate. And they got tired of losing to us. Guess what? Teams are still tired of losing to MJC speech team. We have one of the, the winningest team on this campus to illustrate that. Uh, well, this year alone we have earned in competition 104 trophies in competition with schools such as Berkeley, San Francisco State, Chico State, Fresno, Sac State, Stanford, Laverne, UCLA, you name it, and we outscore them almost every time. This last fall we went to three tournaments. The first tournament we took a third place overall team sweepstakes. The next two tournaments we took first place overall and we beat all those universities in those competitions. So I'm kind of proud of our speech team. You'll see some good samples of what we do tonight. But I want you to know who is on the speech team. And to do that, I'd like to introduce my co-director, partner in crime, you might say, Mr. Marlon Bates, who has uh, 
just finished his master's degree in speech and I'm glad to see that because he was on the University of Pacific team as an undergraduate when I was judging him so I've known him for quite a while he's a very welcome addition to MJC Forensics. Mr. Bates. Thank you Dr. Ewing. It is my privilege and honor to introduce to you the spring 1999 Modesto Junior College speech team. In alphabetical order, if you could welcome them with your applause. Michelle Anthony. <laughs> Justin Buchanan. <laughs> Heather Folks. Adi Goldman. Natalie Goreal, <laughs> Teresa Hasbrook, <laughs> Jessica Johnson, <laughs> Corinne May, <laughs> Ryan Munoz, <laughs> Carlo Petrioli, <laughs> Raul Segura, Sarah Spears, Jason Starn, Sharla Welch, Josh Wilkerson, and Corey Yates. Ladies and gentlemen, your MJC speech team. Take a bow, folks. All right, get off the stage, whichever works. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It is now again my privilege and honor to introduce one more member of the speech team who will introduce our first event. If you could give another warm welcome for Michelle Anthony. Hello, everyone. Tonight's first speech that you will hear is a persuasive speech. A persuasive speech is a speech to influence attitude, behavior, and values on a certain subject or topic. I would like to introduce to you Josh Wilkerson with his award-winning speech on bankruptcy. Chad Weatherington is a 29-year-old assistant manager at a local neighborhood pharmacy just like the one by your house. Chad is typical of the 1.2 million people who decided to file for bankruptcy in 1997. With the proper forms filled out but not yet submitted, Mr. Weatherington grabbed his credit cards and went on a shopping spree. There he bought two Armani suits a $10,000 home entertainment system, including a 52-inch TV and surround sound. He also bought a set of Ping customized golf clubs, and last but not least, more clothes. The grand total, as reported by the Associated Press December 7, 1997, came to $27,321.72. Five days later, Mr. Weatherington decided to submit his papers for bankruptcy. The end result? He paid not one dime towards his extravagant new toys and was allowed to keep all of them. Unfortunately, this situation is becoming commonplace in the American social landscape. You see, as I have previously stated, 1.2 million people file for bankruptcy every year, and many of them, like Chad Weatherington, will abuse and manipulate the system for personal gain. This scourge of bankruptcy, which is infecting our nation, must be dealt with swiftly and seriously, for it represents an extremely grave th threat to our nation. Out of control consumers with credit cards who are getting protection of the laws for not acting responsibly with money that, quite frankly, they don't have. Today, I will go over three different areas of analysis with you. First, we'll take a look at the fundamentals of bankruptcy. Secondly, we'll examine the current flaws and inadequacies of our bankruptcy system. Third and finally, I'll advocate a plan needed to correct this disastrous and rising trend. 
First, however, it is pertinent that you have a solid comprehension of the calculus of bankruptcy itself. Almost all bankruptcies are filed under two chapters, Chapter 7 or Chapter 13. Under Chapter 7, an officer of the court will come in, obtain the filer's hard assets, and liquidate them or sell them. From there, the proceeds will be distributed to that filer's creditors. From there, the courts wipe out all remaining debts. Now, the second chapter is Chapter 13. And under Chapter 13, hard, hard assets are exempt from being liquidated. This is because the filer and the court work out a payment plan to pay off most or some of the bills. From there, all further debts are expunged. So now that you have a comprehension of the process of bankruptcy itself, let's look to examine some of the inadequacies of the current bankruptcy system. Two cases illustrate the inadequacies and flaws of our system quite vividly. They are the stories of Roy Gomez and Sherry Gilbert. Roy Gomez was a hard-working man, but found that he used his credit a little bit too much. So he decided to file for bankruptcy under Chapter 7. When the court went to obtain his hard assets, they found he had relatively few. They would have taken his house, but he rented. They would have taken his car, but he leased. All they could get was some furniture, a few antiques, and a TV. In the end, Mr. Gomez paid less than a tenth of what he owed back to the people who had trusted him with credit. Sherry Gilbert, on the other hand, elected to file for bankruptcy under Chapter 13. What she did with the courts was to work out an 18-month payment plan. Now, Ms. Gilbert owed $435,000 to various creditors. After 18 months, she still owed $317,000. But because the courts believe she made a good faith effort, they discharged those debts. In the end, Sherry Gilbert was allowed to keep an eight-bedroom house, a 1996 Porsche she had bought on an unpaid charge card. She also purchased and kept a pair of Kawasaki jet skis for her son that went unpaid and a string of condos in the Caribbean. Quote, we are seeing less and less of I want to pay people back and more and more of I just want a fresh start, says Los Angeles bankruptcy attorney Joseph Eisenberger. Eisenberger further contends that a significant increase in bankruptcy filing rates in the United States is directly attributed to our lax cultural attitude about credit cards. You see, people just don't take them very seriously. And in the end, we all pay the price. The case in point, Dustin Bell, a wealthy California psychiatrist, decided to stop his practice for about nine months and go gallivanting around the world using his credit cards to finance this trip. At the end, the total bill was $75,000. But because the good doctor had been out of the office for the previous year, he didn't have any money to pay those bills. Hence, he filed under Chapter 13. And in the end, the good doctor only paid back $15,000 of the money he owed. But he was allowed to keep his $1.5 million house, his Royals Royce, a 137-foot yacht, and did I mention a quaint abode in the Hamptons. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have here is a crisis of irresponsibility that is affecting our nation. People no longer take financial responsibility, and as a result, all people involved in commerce, consumers, producers, corporations, have to pay for it. For instance, the March 3rd, 1997 edition of Fortune magazine contends that last year telephone long distance carriers had to eat over $1 billion in unpaid phone accounts. Simultaneously, many of our nation's banks and credit card companies had to take a loss of $17 billion in unpaid credit card receipts. Now, unfortunately for you and I, these companies are forced to pass the cost on to us. In fact, the American Bankruptcy Institute estimates that credit card companies have to tack on an extra 6 to 8 percent on everybody's credit card to make up for yearly losses due to unpaid credit card receipts. Otherwise, we may see credit card rates as low as 9 to 11 percent as opposed to the national average of 19 to 27 percent. 
But until people start taking responsibility for their financial flings, and until the bankruptcy laws are amended to be effective, adequate, concise, and we have the ability to enforce those laws and the intent of them, credit card interest rates are only going to go up, not down. So now that we've examined how the system is mangled, how it's broken, and how it's manipulated, the question you have to ask is how do we fix it? Well, there are two simple steps this nation can take to fight bankruptcy and the inadequacies of our bankruptcy system. Now, the first step was already partially enacted by the House of Representatives, and that's the tightening down of the bankruptcy chapters, specifically Chapter 7 and Chapter 13. What the House did was to tighten down Chapter 7. Because Chapter 7 is the more lenient of the two chapters, Congress said, hey, what we need to do is reserve this for the very poor who truly don't have the capacity to pay their bills, forcing everyone else to move to the more punishing Chapter 13. Now this ensures that businesses and commerce get the money they rightfully deserve, and that those who are debtors and who are chronic abusers of credit are punished adequately. But beyond that, what we need to do is to stop courts from being limited to liquidate luxury assets. If you file for bankruptcy, the first thing that should be liquidated and sold are luxury assets. It's just common sense. Now, the second step we as a nation need to take to stop the bane of bankruptcy, which is affecting America, is to go ahead and to make the credit card companies and the banks stop shooting themselves in the foot. You see, every week, credit card companies such as Visa, MasterCard, and Discover send out millions of credit cards and credit card offerings in the mail without doing any background credit checks on the people they send them to. So truly, how can the banks and the credit card companies be, well, baffled when people take them for money? The truth is, ladies and gentlemen, conventional wisdom needs to be applied to the credit industry. We ought to make it mandatory that background credit checks are done before credit cards are sent out to potential debtors in the mail. Once again, it's an insertion of common sense. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in interesting times to say the least. Our economy is up, yet our morals are down. And bankruptcy is becoming an insidious affection which is afflicting our nation. Today, I have spoken to you about the fundamentals of bankruptcy. Second, I have defined and illustrated the current inadequacies with our bankruptcy system. Finally, I have provided a simple two-step plan that we can enact in America to fight bankruptcy manipulation and to amend the laws which are creating inadequacies and room for fraud within our system. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, if we do nothing about the current bankruptcy crisis, America's best days may well be over. Our next event is called Dramatic Duo or Duo Interpretation. Now this event involves a cutting or cuttings from a play and a portrayal of two or more characters done by two people. Keep in mind that this is not acting. In fact, it is harder because no costumes or props can be used. <coughs> a manuscript must also be used during this event at all times, so don't think they're lazy. They, they did memorize their lines. With that, I'd like to present to you Jessica Johnson and Teresa Hasbrook. Everything from ESP to witchcraft, there's even an expert on UFO abduction phenomenon. One holdover from the 60s, a local Swami who once made his living writing for Hustler, now offers workshops in sex as a doorway to divinity. Barbara? Yes? I know your past. <laughs> Excuse me? It's me, John Biddle. Well, Joanna now, Muncie, Indiana. You look fabulous. Your eyes are your whole face. Oh, hey, how is your mother? Joanna Biddle, 
Hmm, that sounds vaguely familiar. John, remember we went out twice senior year? Once for fun and then once so you could mock me in front of the entire senior class? <laughs> Not little Biddle. <laughs> Not anymore. I had it snipped. My God. I thought I was, until you dashed my dreams. Just as well, really. Say, uh, could you turn that thing off? I'm not anxious to become one of the curios you collect on this hunting expedition. Okay, so we don't know anything about witchcraft or UFO abductions. But we do know about revenge. Pure, sweet, satisfying revenge. How to get back at somebody. How to make them eat their words. How to make them look at you with those sweet, sad, sappy eyes and say, Oh, I'm so sorry. You're wonderful. You're a goddess. You're a Teresa, diva. You're a... Teresa, oh, yeah. Sorry. I forgot. You guys get the idea, right? Sure. Anywho, it's not about revenge because we love it. And it's not about how to get revenge because we've got that too. But how to get it back at somebody without it coming back to haunt you. For Joanna, it seems the best revenge she can take on Barbara is being a success at her own life in The, the Spirit, Spirit is, is Willing by Nicole B. Quinn. So tell me, Barbara, are you still a self-centered bitch? Do I detect a note of bitterness? Take it as a compliment, sweetie. Some of us actually admired you for it. You remember more about my life than I do. Oh, that's because I studied you. It must have been very lonely being Barbara. Oh, I see you've taken a degree in amateur psychology. Paranormal psychology, actually. <laughs> You're joking, right? No, I'm not. But I heard you became a lawyer. Do you practice? Only numerology and tarot. <laughs> Male lawyer turned female gypsy. What a story. A little bit true confessions for you, dear. So, do you have any children? Three. Two girls and a boy. So, now would you be their mother or <laughs> their father? Father. Medical science hasn't come that far yet. So, you were gay? No. I was a woman trapped in a man's body. Now I'm gay. <laughs> Okay, so let me get this straight. You changed your sex to become a lesbian? No, I changed my sex to become a woman. Consequently, men have never turned me on. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry, dear. You're no longer my type. Too socially correct, too waspy, too mean. Tell me, is your husband still screwing the starlet? Oh, I see. Muncie's not such a dull place after all. I should have attended more of those high school reunions. So tell me, Joanna, what else do you divine in my aura? Oh, I needn't divine anything about you, dear. Since that little bit of exhibitionism on lifestyles of the rich and famous, I can follow your byline. So, tell me, why are you here, Barbara? To ridicule and humiliate? To inform. Meditation and past life regression don't seem quite your beat. What can I say? I'm curious. As to how many peons you had beheaded or the acreage of your plantation? Yeah, something like that. I'm sorry, that was judgmental of me. For all I know, you could be very enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you really believe any of this new age hype? Oh, if you sift through enough crap, you might find a few genuine spiritualists here. And how does one tell the real from the fake? Basic instincts. And I don't mean dykes with ice picks. No. But I don't think your expose has room to embrace the simple truth. Such as? Ordinary people leading plain and exemplary lives, using their talents with little fanfare for the well-being of others. So this iconographic display is really a parody of itself, and these gold-digging gurus aren't masquerading as messiahs now, are they? That's not what it means at all. Sure. There are those who enlighten their pockets while they hawk the New Age version of the dashboard Jesus. but. If you look closer and seek with unveiled eyes, Barbara, you just might see people who actually see things. You might actually see them. So tell me, John, do you see them? <laughs> Every day, with the mind and the heart. Academics who now study the New Age consider it a kind of fundamentalism, where for liberals, consciousness is numbed, not raised. This trade show marketing products targeted for human potential has attracted some 21,000 shoppers to the Hilton Convention Center over a three-day period. From tribal drums to crystals, this buffet of spiritual communism... Bebe. Who said that? Bebe, your mother's saying you're not wanting to be Jewish. This is not funny! In the war, I pretend I'm not, you know. Stop it! Every night, 
in the German army barracks, I was afraid if I slept, I would utter a word in Yiddish, a Kaddish for so many dead. I didn't dream for three years. Nana? It is so hard to decide, baby. What is right? Do we stand up and fight for the one or rise together and fight for the many? These questions, they plague me even now. Nana? Was I doing that lampshade on the head thing or just having wild sex with strangers? Why are you doing this? My, 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 what got your knickers all wet? <laughs> Must have been after high school. You certainly could have exacted your pound of flesh with that tasty little morsel. So what are you gonna do? Sell it to the tabloids? Barbara Manning hides Jewish heritage to become prom queen. Limited potential for character assassination, I'm afraid. Dear little Barbara, one always has something dark and dirty to drive an ambitious little engine. But please, don't measure me by your warped, albeit expensive, yardstick. You don't understand. You have no idea what it's like to hear disparaging remarks uttered only because no one suspects. An insider's view on hatred. Knowing that they hated Jews, made sleeping in their beds, telling their trite little secrets, and screwing their sons that much more enjoyable. You see, Joanna, in this country, power comes from fitting in. Having that always impressive membership to an all-washed club. Even if it is as Mrs. Somebody or another. Funny. That's what I was led to believe about being a man. The most powerful day of my life was when I chose to give up my membership. John, I'm really not all Jewish. My father's not, you know. I really don't care. John? Yes, Barbara. Was it real? Nana, I mean. You want guarantees on the ephemeral? Was it real? Is love real? No matter how much we comprehend the emotion, once we are infected, we are servants. Look around you. Do you see them? All those murky existentials just eager to worm their way into existence. And you are the receptacle of that dormant slime. Through you, it oozes into being. And you just let it happen. You vapid, vain little creature. Was it real? Am I? I'm going to intrude in the program for one quick moment here to prepare, let the debaters prepare for the debate. You see, in the kind of debate that we compete in, parliamentary style debate, the debate teams do not know what the topic will be each round until 15 minutes before the debate starts. So they have to be ready for anything. The topics are philosophical uh, or current events topics. And they have to 15 minutes to plan what they think their opponent might say and how to refute it and to construct their own case and then be ready to enter the chamber and debate. <clears throat> and the topic for tonight is, are you ready? This house believes a man's place is in the home. <laughs> the government must uphold that resolution in the debate and prove that's a true statement. The loyal opposition must prove the opposite. And now, to, be, to continue with the program, Corey Yates will describe the next event to you. Good luck to you. Okay. Our next event is impromptu speaking. Impromptu speaking is an unprepared event. Uh, the competitor gets a topic and then has two minutes to prepare for a five minute speech. The topics can range from anything from quotations to one word abstracts like love. Uh, to demonstrate impromptu speaking today is Ryan or Justin. 
Justin, I believe. Uh, but first we're going to bring out uh, Marlon Bates to get topics from you guys. Thank you. Well, thanks for that smattering of applause there. <laughs> if I could have the house lights or at least the lights shining in my eyes down just a wee bit, control room, I'm appealing to the gods of light. Please lower them just a tad. There you go. All right, so we're going to play. Everybody can hear me? I've been told that I'm the loudest lecturer in Founders Hall. Let's see if I can pull that up. We're going to divide the audience in three here. So all of you over here, you are one group. You are going to think with one mind. Just You are the high, right? You hear, you are the most, you're the largest group, you're, you're one. You think the ant colony, okay? Over here, you're one group. So just start thinking together, get the psychic bond going. Call up the psychic friends network. We can all work together. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to get topics for Justin Buchanan. So he has no possible way that he could have known these topics ahead of time. I swear I don't have anybody planted in the audience. Right. Okay. <laughs> Those of you that are not planted in the audience, don't give yourselves away. For the first group here, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds here. You are going to think of some famous person. So get that high mind working together. Think of a famous person. The largest group, I need the most brain power for this topic. I need you to think of an abstract topic. Now, abstract means you can't touch it. Can't see it, can't feel it, hear it, so it's not chocolate, anything like that. Oh, by the way, let me, let me back up. Clean. It's got to be clean. <laughs> clean. Very clean. All right. You group over here. You're going to think with a hive mind. You're going to give me a cliche. Some trite phrase. Your mother told you over and over again. Something like that. Okay, think. 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 Okay, over here. Do I have a volunteer for a famous person? Elvis. Elvis. Nah, he's good. Okay, we'll keep Elvis in mind. Somebody else. Einstein. Einstein. Okay, gentlemen, raise your hands. Got the nice beard there. I like it. Chesty Butler. Yes. Pardon? Chesty Butler. Uh, that sounds vaguely unclean. <laughs> Way in the back there. John Holmes. See? <laughs> right. You're going to have to go with Elvis here. Last chance. Right there. Hey, want to go to Winston? Yeah. All right. I said clean. <laughs> All right. Last chance here in the red. Linda Paxton. Okay. Wow. <laughs> You've just exceeded my knowledge. Congratulations. All right. Obviously, you did not call the Psychic Friends Network. One last try. Right there. Guy Worthington and his dog Splunk. I like that. There we go. <laughs> Cal Worthington and his dog Spot. Let me write that down there. Cal. Worthington. Any particular dog spot you had in mind? You know, the elephant, the shark, what? Monkey. The monkey, okay. And his dog, Spot the monkey. All right. Let's give them a hand, shall we? All right, I'm going to reiterate after the John Holmes fiasco. Center group, you must be clean. So you have an abstract right here in the front. Spiritual, okay. Well, let's work with that right there. Faith, all right, behind him. Motivation, I'm liking this. Okay, what? Right there, yeah. Anger. Anger, mm, all right. Way in the back there, right in the middle. Patriotism. 
Oh, I'm liking that. Okay, let's see. We got faith, we got patriotism, we got spiritual. I'm going with all the way in the back with a pin in their hand. Postmodern education. <laughs> You're trying for that Linda Paxton, weren't you? All right. Okay, let two hands up. Obviously very vociferous. Irony. All right, we're going with irony. All right, give them a hand. All right, they've obviously thought very hard, so the third group, it's up to you. I need a trite phrase right there. The gentleman in the quick. Yes? Pardon me? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Okay, I'm like an ant, come on, another right there. Stop doing that or you'll go blind. I said clean. It's a. Hey. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. All right, give them a hand. <laughs> By the way, Justin will want to kill you all, but that's okay. All right, Mr. Munoz, if you could take the center stage there for timing. Mr. Buchanan, if you could come out center stage. See, I ask you for a number of them so Justin never knows what we're going to do. That's how you say it. Mr. Buchanan, are you ready? Oh, yeah. Mr. Munoz, are you ready? Okay, Mr. Buchanan has two minutes to create a five minute speech for your enjoyment. If you could please keep it relatively quiet, we'll play Jeopardy music in the background. Zena picks a lot of food. 
But exactly why does Dina get food? Well, I would tend to say that it's because she's aroused from what she's doing. Now get your minds out of the gutter. I'm not talking about her being aroused because of my lucky underwear. <laughs> no, what I'm talking about is the love for what she's at and the love for what she's doing. Now when we look at Cal Worthington and his dog Spot the Monkey, <laughs> we find that because Cal Worthington performs on television, he must be motivated in the things that he does. But the real question is, what motivates Cal Worthington? Or is dog Spot the Monkey? In order to better understand this, we're first going to examine a psychological framework known as the arousal theory of Dirks and Dodson. And then we'll apply this arousal theory to a real life situation, mainly the 1992 presidential debates, and see how it works in real life. So first, let's set up the psychological framework of the Yerkes Dodson law. In 1908, two gentlemen, Drs. R. N. Yerkes and J.D. Dodson, created what's now known as the Yerkes Dodson law, in which they tried to bridge the gap between somebody's level of arousal and their level of performance. They did so very successfully. What they were trying to do was say that if somebody's level of arousal was really high or too low, or their level of anxiety was too high or too low, that they would perform very poorly in the task that they were trying to accomplish. Dr. Donald Hebb wrote in his book, Organization of Behavior, along the same lines. What he said was that if a person is actually trying to do something, and they want to do it really, really bad, that their level of arousal will be really, really high. Therefore, their level of anxiety will also be very, very high. And they'll probably perform very poorly in the task they're trying to accomplish. On the other hand, if a person is to perform very, very poorly and they don't really want to do what they're doing, then their level of arousal and anxiety will both be low and they will perform very poorly. He suggests that we try to find a middle ground. Aristotle would call it temperance between the two. And if we found that temperance, or that middle ground, then we would compete very well in the task that we're trying to accomplish. And if we don't create these tasks, and if we don't find this middle ground, then what happens is we become very disorganized and very influent in the things that we try to do. So we can see, by first examining the Yerkes Dodson law, what actually motivates people like Hal Worthington in his dog spot, the monkey. So how does this play into our real life? Well, in order to examine this, we need to examine the 1992 presidential debates. Why? Because in 1992, there were three candidates, each representing an end of the spectrum. On the far end, we had, of course, the kook, Ross Perot. Now, most people say that Ross Perot was very motivated to do what he was doing. He was really a rat. And I know that's a sick thing to think of. But it's true. <laughs> He wanted to be there so badly that his level of arousal and anxiety were really, really high. Unfortunately, that hurt him a lot. Or maybe fortunately. And he lost the presidential debate because he was very disfluent. On the other end, we have somebody like George Bush, then president. And when we look at George Bush, what we find is that he's constantly looking at his watch. He wants to get out of it. Many political analysts say that he didn't really want to become president. Why? He won a war. The economy was good and he didn't care. The point is that he, his arousal was very low and his anxiety was very low, so he performed very poorly. In the middle ground, we have a gentleman by the name of William Jefferson Clinton. Now most people say that his arousal has hurt him since he's been in office. <laughs> but the point is that in that debate, he found temperance, and most political analysts say that he won that debate, ultimately winning him the election. And ultimately, well, you get my point. So today, we've started off by examining the Yerkes Dodson Law and how our motivations and our arousal are one and the same. And then, we apply this to the 1990 <coughs> presidential debate. When we look at people like Cal Worthington and those people who perform on television, and we look especially at Cal Worthington, we realize that maybe his motivation is out of whack somewhere, because he's a terrible actor. But when we look at somebody like Xena, Warrior Princess, my personal hero and my, and my future wife, we find that she found that temperance, that middle ground. And by doing that, she saved the world from people like Ross Perot. The next speech you will hear is an informative speech. This is a 10 minute speech, usually using visual aids that clearly illustrates and describes the topic. This informative speech will be presented to you by Natalie Goyal.
Well, it all began in 1968. They were looking for something to provide extra calories for premature babies. Unfortunately, the researchers at Procter & Gamble didn't come up with a solution for premature babies. They came up with something a little different. The researchers stumbled upon the new popular fat-free oil, Olestra, which is now being used in chips. Olestra has recently boomed into many of our supermarkets. Snack shelves are now being packed with the Lester brand products. Procter & Gamble has spent 25 years and more than $200 million in developing Olestra. And that is why it's so important. Because here we have companies and researchers spending a lot of time, money, and effort in developing these new substitution products that are replacing the old products we've been using for years. And Olestra by far is one of those substitutions. And it's important that we understand it because it may very well appear in a variety of the foods we eat. And Americans these days are trying to watch what they eat because of the increase in the number of health problems due to poor eating habits. A recent study was done just a few days ago that Americans are now eating more vegetables than they have before. But there's a catch. Those vegetables they are eating are fried. This study supports the fact that more than one-third to one-half of Americans are overweight. So in a sense, Olestra has been a dream come true for dieters, snackers, and health-conscious Americans. But before you decide to hit the supermarket, there are three very important questions you should consider. First, what is Olestra? Second, what are the possible side effects? And finally, what will be the future of Olestra? So let's first start out with actually understanding what it really is. According to the June 29th, 1998 issue of Newsweek, Olestra is made of sucrose polyester, a fat that is soybean based and made with other natural ingredients such as sugar and vegetable oil. This is all then chemically processed, making Olestra the first fat replacer that is heat stable at high temperatures. Procter & Gamble have come up with Olean, which is the manufacturing name for Olestra. And with this, they have provided Frito-Lay, which is owned by Pepsi, with Olean to market their new brand of WOW fat-free potato chips. Frito-Lay has already sold 300,000 bags of their WOW chips in just 31 stores in three states. Now the difference between the WOW chips versus regular chips is the fact that the WOW chips have less fat and less calories. But in terms of taste, there isn't much of a difference. According to the March 1998 Nutrition Action Health Letter, wild potato chips have no fat and only 75 calories, and this is in 16 chips. Regular potato chips with the same portion have 10 grams of fat and 150 calories. Now we can see a significant difference because the wild chips have half the calories of regular potato chips. Tortilla chips made with Olestra have one gram of fat and 90 calories, and this is in six chips. Regular tortilla chips with the same portion have 140 calories and six grams of fat. Again, a significant difference, because if you look at it, the tortilla chips made with Olestra have one gram of fat and six chips versus regular tortilla chips, which have six grams of fat in one chip. Products by Nabisco, such as Wheat Thins and Ritz Crackers, are also being test marketed with Olean. Well, Olestra seems like a great idea. Snacks with no fat. However, there are a few possible side effects. First, the molecules in Olestra are too big and tightly packed together than regular oil, making it impossible for the body to digest. So, Olestra leaves no calories behind as it passes straight through the digestive tract. Passing through the digestive tract unabsorbed may act as a laxative for some people. According to the December 30th, 1998 issue of the New Republic, the undigested calories may cause abdominal cramping, loose stools, gas, and diarrhea. There have been thousands of people so far that have complained Olestra has done so. There have been several members of my own speech team that have complained Olestra has done so. Unfortunately, there have been some very severe cases reported. One case involves Jean Mendoke of Marin, Iowa, 
a 49-year-old sixth grade school teacher who normally could eat anything without becoming sick. Well, one night while watching the 10 o'clock news, she tried a couple of the WOW chips. After about an hour or so, she decided to go to bed, but she was stopped by a magnitude of pain that was almost like the beginning of labor. Now, the pain eventually subsided just before the severe diarrhea hit. Jean was severely ill for 13 to 14 hours. According to the March 1998 issue of Reader's Digest, another downside to Olestra is a loss of vitamins A, D, E, and K. Olestra inhibits the absorptions of these vitamins into the body. However, the Food and Drug Administration does require Procter & Gamble to fortify any brand of Olestra products with these four vitamins to compensate for their losses. The loss of carotenoids in Olestra has roused up a lot of controversy. Carotenoids are the plant pigments that makes fruits and vegetables red, yellow, and orange. You can also find carotenoids in green leafy vegetables. Walter Willett, head of the nutrition department of the Harvard School of Public Health, says that there are dozens of studies that indicate carotenoids help protect against cancer, heart disease, and macular degeneration, the most common form of blindness that strikes the elderly. In 1993, Procter & Gamble did a study about the effects of carotenoids. And in this study, they rounded up 39 men and women who were to eat 16 chips made with Olestra every day for eight weeks. This study proved that these people had a 50% drop in their total blood carotenoid level. The National Cancer Institution stated that in 1995, researchers at Unilever, a Dutch company, were also considering manufacturing their own form of Olestra. They too did a study, rounding up 53 men and women who were to eat three grams of margarine containing Olestra. Now, this is the equivalent to about six chips with each main meal. Well, after four weeks, the volunteers had 40% less lycopene in their blood. Lycopene is a type of carotenoid found largely in tomatoes. Men who eat more foods enriched with lycopene appear to have a lower risk of prostate cancer. However, the FDA, along with Procter & Gamble, maintain that there's no proof that carotenoids are effective. But the government's own dietary guidelines for Americans cited that carotenoids do play a potentially beneficial role in reducing the risks of cancer and certain other chronic diseases. Well, Olestra does have some negative and not so pleasant side effects, but the future for it doesn't look so bad. According to Reader's Digest, Olestra was approved in January of 1996 by the Food and Drug Administration, one of the toughest scientific bodies for scrutinizing products. However, the FDA does have guidelines Procter & Gamble must follow. According to the May 7, 1997 issue of the U.S. News & World Report, any product containing Olestra must have a safety label, allowing the consumers to be aware of the side effects. And this safety label states, this product contains Olestra. Olestra may cause abdominal cramping in loose stools. Olestra inhibits the absorptions of some vitamins and other nutrients. Vitamins A, D, E, and K have been added. However, the safety label hasn't stopped consumers from buying Olestra brand products. According to the May 10, 1998 issue of the Wall Street Journal, an annualized basis suggests that the WOW line of chips will bring in 550 million in manufacturing cells and 900 million in retail sales for Frito-Lay. Olestra is definitely booming because Procter & Gamble have decided to open up a new $100 million Olestra plant this year in Cincinnati, right where their first run already is. We can conclude that Procter & Gamble have spent a lot of time, money, and effort in developing Olestra, and it has paid off because they have signed up with a dozen companies that will feature Olestra in their products. Experiments have proven that Olestra may be used in other foods besides snacks. For example, it can be used in oil, shortening, cheese, salad dressings, and even ice cream. However, beyond snack chips, the FDA must have a separate review and approval. Olestra, it's a product with many downsides as well as good sides. However, with the background on what Olestra is, what its possible side effects are, and Olestra's future, you now have the knowledge to make your own decision about it. And remember, Olestra may seem like a dream come true to some people, but to others, it can be their worst nightmare. Thank you.
We're now going to com commence with the parliamentary debate on that very meaningful topic. This House believes that a man's place is in the home. And I should explain a little more about this type of event to you so you'll know what's happening up here. First of all, you are now all members of Parliament, okay? And you will be addressed by members of Parliament, the Prime Minister and a member of government on this side, the leader of the loyal opposition party on this side, and a member of the opposition party. And if you've ever watched C-SPAN when they have questions for the Prime Minister, you know that in the British House of Commons, they encourage things they like to, they like hearing said by saying things such as, hear, hear. And you might have noticed that, how many, I don't know if any was watched that or not. But if you like something one of the speakers says, you may pound on the seat and say, hear, hear, to encourage them, let them know you like that. If you don't like what they're saying, booing and hissing is not polite in our culture. But you can do a little shame, shame. <laughs> can I hear a real encouraging hear, hear from you? Hear, hear. Yeah. Excellent. Can I hear a shame, shame? Yeah. All right. Another thing you might notice that looks a little strange in this debate is that when a speaker is at the lectern here addressing you, they may say something that will trigger a question from the opposing team. And if they have what we call a point of information, they will stand, put their hand on their head, and gesture toward the speaker. Now they're not trying to imitate a light pole or anything like that. That is a tribute to the traditional debates in Parliament in which members of Parliament would jump up with a point of information and if they jumped up too fast, the wig that they wore back then would fly off of their head. So they got in the habit of putting their hand on their head, then standing up and saying point of information. And we continue that practice in parliamentary debate. Now the speaker may or may not choose to let them state their point or ask their question. They may say, not now, I'm busy, please sit down. Or they may say, yes, I'll take your question on that matter. It's up to the speaker. And so if you see that happening, you know why. That's where we get the term, uh, don't flip your lid, because those people would jump up too fast and their wig would fall off. Or don't jump to conclusions too quickly. And to begin the debate, we also have to explain there is a moderator. The Speaker of the House, just as in our own Congress and Senate, there is a speaker who controls the debate and recognizes speakers, grants them the floor, and no one else may address the Parliament unless the Speaker of the House gives them the floor. We have a real live British Speaker of the House <laughs> right now. Mr. Ryan Munoz, will you come out, please? The table will be over there, okay? Doesn't he look like a British judge or a Speaker of the House? Yeah. He will control the debate. And now, debaters, will you come out? And I turn this parliament over to the Speaker of the House. It is now in your hands, Mr. Speaker. Hear ye, hear ye. I now call this House to order. I would now like to announce the opponents and the people who are debating today. Carlo Padillo and Justin Buchanan versus Corinne May and Sarah Spears. Give me your hand! We will now hear a speech from the Prime Minister, the Honorable Carlo Cadillo, for no longer than four minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I was going to say how absolutely uh, rather enticing you look this evening, but actually since the last name is Pedrioli, not <laughs> Potato or whatever you said, I will kindly refrain from those uh, wonderful remarks. Here, here. That having been said, 
Thank you very much. That having been said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Parliament. I'd like to first of all thank the honorable but loyal opposition, Ms. Spears and Ms. May, for being here to debate with us. And of course, my partner, my tag team partner in crime, Mr. Buchanan, for being here to assist me in winning this wonderful debate round. So then, let's jump right in, ladies and gentlemen, members of Parliament. It goes on and on and on. It went on all through 1998. It went on all through January 1999. And it looks as though it's going to go on and on and on until the election in the year 2000. And ladies and gentlemen, it could all have ended had Bill simply stayed at home. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, pause, I posit that had Mrs. Clinton held the office instead, we would not be here having this debate. And of course, that then brings us to the resolution for the evening. This House believes a man's place is in the home. Now simply, we just uh, simply like to put out that this House would be the United States or the global society. In other words, we're talking about the whole planet here at home and around the world because it's a universal issue. We believe the other terms are fa fairly self-explanatory. So first of all, we'd like to posit that men are problems when they're out of the home. Now in addition... <laughs> In addition to Bill, I'd like to point to the idea of Arthur Dimmesdale in the Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, Mr. Dimmesdale had a job outside of the home. He was a reverend, a minister. And what happened? Well, he ended up getting his lover pregnant. That was not a good thing. Now, moving beyond that idea... Moving beyond that idea, I'd like to take a look at the idea of war. Every single war throughout the history of mankind, womankind, and childkind has been caused by a man. The man, the man was a problem because he was out of the home. And we could see it would be a better thing if the man would be at home. I don't think Hitler would have been able to start World War II had he been at home watching television. <laughs> Of course, Hitler didn't have a wife, as far as we know. Our second major assertion, ladies and gentlemen, this evening is that men can do good things at home. Prime example, let's go back to 1993 and look at Robin Williams in Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> Now look at all those wonderful things that Robin Williams could do as Mrs. Doubtfire. He simply had to do them in disguise. And ladies and gentlemen, it is, is it a shame when a man must do those wonderful things hidden behind the cloak of womankind? <laughs> Beyond that, let's take a look at the idea of the wonderful men on this old house. They're at home. They're in a house. They're doing handy things. Women, don't you wish you had them at home all the time to fix all those things? <laughs> And finally, ladies and gentlemen, under this idea, Mr. Bob Dole could do a wonderful job selling Viagra from the home. I think so. I'm sure he could do it from the couch. They could film it right there. Finally, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, ladies and gentlemen. We contend this evening that women do a lot of good outside the home. Let's look over to England, to Mrs. Thatcher. She showed what a woman in power could do outside of the home. She took over and held hostage Great Britain for 11 years. <laughs> All right, so there are no international relations majors here. Let's take a look at what Mrs. Dole could do if she were outside of the home. She wouldn't have to be tagging along doing those wonderful interviews that she had done. Instead, she could do something like leading America. And finally, under that, it looks as though I have about 30 seconds left. Finally, under that, we'd like to point out that those novelists writing in the style of Jane Austen about women who are always trying to get married so they could move to someone else's home could do something different and more creative. They could write about the men trying to get married and going out and finding someone else's home. And then all the guys wouldn't have to read Jane Austen in high school and there'd probably be more men majoring in English in college and I wouldn't feel so weird. So ladies and gentlemen, for these main contentions, men are problems out of home, men can, uh, men can be good at home, and women are good out of the home. We believe that we will be able to uphold this resolution. This House believes a man's place is in the home. And for the first time, we beg to propose. Sarah Spears, Leader of Opposition, for a speech no longer than four minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody.
everybody. I would like to thank the wonderful Speaker of the House for being here today, and I think that he looks absolutely lovely today. I want to thank, of course, the wonderful government for providing a great case, and to my wonderful partner who has helped me to take apart their case piece by piece. Now, just starting with Bill Clinton and their example in the beginning, saying that Bill should have stayed home. Now, if you look at what Bill was doing outside of the home, stuff that should be done in the home, can you imagine how much crap he'd be in trouble for now if he had been staying at home and doing the kind of stuff he was doing in the Oval Office? Which leads us directly to why we oppose this today's resolution, being that this House believes that a man's place is in the home. Definitions aside, let's jump first to the government case and then we'll cover the oppositional case. Now, the first point is that men are problems when they're out of the home. And they talked about the scarlet letter. Well, if you look at what happened in the scarlet letter, the reverend left his job, entered a home, and did some bad things. We all know that men can actually go out there in the world and do some wonderful things. They talked about war. And I'm sure that us women love to think that we could all be G.I. Jane and go fight the wars for America. But unfortunately, when we look at what's going on in the United States, men have a place designated within the military, which is one of the points that we're going to get into later on. When we look to these things at what men are doing outside of the home, clearly we see that they're doing a lot more trouble inside. Now, I'm going to ask you all a question. How many times have you seen a man change a roll of toilet paper? <laughs> here, here. How many times have men come up and said, what color is this, and can I mix it with this red? <laughs> when men are doing laundry, they don't have a clue. So we see with the trouble that they're getting into in the home is even worse than the trouble they're getting outside of it. They caused, talked about war under this first point as well and how men cause a lot of war. Look at the Trojan War. It was about a woman trying to stay home. Men took her out of the home and fought over her. Clearly we see that women cause a lot of problems too. And we're going to get into that very clearly, how when women come out of the home, we cause a lot of problems. Another second point, they talked about how men could do good things at home, and I think I've already covered this a little bit, but it's looking specifically at Mrs. Doubtfire. If anybody's seen the movie, I think Robin Williams set his boobs on fire. <laughs> I don't know about you women, I've never personally done that cooking. <laughs> Clearly we see, once again, men aren't necessarily proficient when it comes to a lot of things. And with that, I'll take Justin's first question. Um, you cook a lot? Actually, yeah. David, be quiet. <laughs> I may not necessarily be Miss Betty Crocker, but I can cook a bowl of cereal, but that's okay. Moving on. They talked about doing handy things, and they talked about how, you know, Bob Dole could do a lot of wonderful things from his home. We're going back to Clinton. I'm sure Clinton can sell Viagra from the Oval Office. He doesn't have to be at home to do that, as we've all unfortunately seen. Now, moving on to their third point, women do good things outside of the home. And I'm not going to come up here and I'm not going to attest this. It's not in the resolution today stating that, you know, women should stay outside of the home. But we are going to look at their one point talking about novelists and marriage. Now, women out there, do you really want to go out there into the dating arena and see men that want to come and move in with you? <laughs> Seriously, think about it. How many men do you want to come and start throwing their garbage around, leaving the toilet seat up, not changing that roll of toilet paper? You know it happens. Now moving on to our first um, little off case that we have going here. This is where we want to put men in their real place. Now our first point, we think men belong in the public eye. All you men out there, I know you're all sexy, you're all beautiful, and we don't want you locked up at home doing our laundry or changing our roll of toilet paper. We want to look at you. Now let's look. Now let's look to the movies. I don't know any of you who have seen Varsity Blues, and I'm not talking about the scrawny, icky, nasty kid from Dawson's Creek. I'm talking about the blonde with the curly hair. I'm talking Tom Cruise. I'm talking Brad Pitt. I'm talking for you that like the skinny man Leonardo DiCaprio. Do we want them locked up at home where we can't see their pretty faces? No, that's right, no. Men belong where we can see them. Men belong where we can drool over them and dream about them. Face it, that's a fact. And that's our first point on the off case. Am I out of time, darling? With that, I'll leave my partner to bring up a lot more stuff, and we beg to oppose. Hi, I'm Justin. I'm not David, as it says on the program. Okay, 
What I'm first going to do is I'm going to attack what Sarah just said on our case because I don't agree, like I shouldn't. <laughs> and then I'll attack what she said on her own case and then add some more ideas that we came up with that we thought were pretty good. Apparently they didn't, but that's besides the point. I'd first like to start off by quoting somebody by the name of Boutros Boutros Ghali. Sounds funny, but he was the former UN Secretary General. And he said that in order for people to be truly equal, all must suffer the same. Women have suffered from universal suffrage for years. Men, it's our turn. <laughs> now, the first thing she says is about Clinton, right? And she says, well, he's caused a lot of trouble outside of the home. Yeah, he has. Get it? Right? Like raising our taxes. That's from outside of the home. If he would have stayed home, I don't think Hillary would have raised her taxes. And I don't think she would have gotten in the same amount of trouble because, personally, I don't find her that attractive. <laughs> now, the next thing she says on our first point, and when we say that men cause problems, she said, well, look at the book Scarlet Letter where the guy left his job. Well, no, personally, he did it inside the church, which was really, really bad. It's going to be struck down sometime. And then she says, well, I'm sure all us women want to go out and be G.I. Janes, but we all can't. Are you a sexist, Sarah? <laughs> I know women out there, you know, it may not look like it, but I work out at the gym. And some of those women, Same. I would love to have them pull me out rather than, you know, Ryan. Oh, now, she brings up these arguments about toilet paper, laundry, and, and stuff like that, but you know what? War? Can't change the toilet paper. I, I, don't, I don't really know. You know, I, I would prefer not being able to change the toilet paper to war. Now, the next thing we say is that men are good at home. You know, look at Mrs. Doubtfire. And she says, well, I can cook. Uh, I talked to David. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. The next thing she says is, well, Bob Dole, Clinton could sell Viagra outside the home just like Bob Dole. Mm, I'm sorry, but I don't even want to picture that. <laughs> okay, now the third thing we talk about is that women do lots of good. And she says, well, this isn't in the re resolution that this doesn't really matter. Well, personally, if everyone stayed inside the home, then guess what? Like, no one would run the country and no one would, like, do a lot of things, which would probably be really bad. So, yes, sir. Wouldn't it be better if the Spice Girls stayed at home? <laughs> I'll get to that in your public eye thing. Okay. Now, the, their argument that they make is basically we want men in the public eye. And she says, well, do we really want people like, you know, Denzel Washington, Tom Cruise to stay at home? Well, I'm sure that Sarah would agree that if they stayed at home with Sarah, that she'd want them home. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? I mean, so then wouldn't it be better for them to stay at home? Now, I'd like to go back and I'd like to reiterate a couple points. On the fact that men have screwed up outside of the home. There's a book out called Against Our Will. I read it just recently because, you know, I'm getting into this feminist thing. Not that I'm a feminist, but I figure I should know both sides of the issue. But in Against Our Will, what it talks about is that universal suffrage and a lot of crime is, guess what, due to men. That we commit most of the crimes in today's society. Sure, there are women out there that commit crimes, but a majority of crimes are committed by men. If they stayed at home, chances are they wouldn't commit these crimes. Now the next thing, argument that we make is that men would do a lot of good at home. And I'd like to bring up the idea of masculinism. It's a philosophy created by this guy, Justin Buchanan. That's me. <laughs> and what it says is that women have been suffering at home for a long time. But now, it's time for men to suffer at home. Because that way we can have something to complain about too. <laughs> and finally, women can do a lot of good. There's a, I'm a philosophy minor, and there's somebody by the name of Ayn Rand. It's her birthday today, that's why I'm bringing it up. She created a lot of books like Atlas Shrug and a lot of good philosophy books. You know what? She wouldn't have had that ability if she would have stayed at home in Russia. And so for these reasons, everybody, I beg to propose today's resolution. Now I call on the member of opposition, Ms. Corinne Mendy, for a speech no longer than four minutes. Hello, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to start off our case by um, going over something that was said. Uh, we want men in the military and not women. Not that we don't want women in the military, but 
We want the men out there fighting for us. And I just want to support this by saying, I would rather have Rambo out there fighting for us than at home washing his bandana. Yeah. Um, another thing we, uh, I just want to move on real quickly here. Um, men do good things at home. Now, this may be true, but um, as my partner pointed out, men don't do much at home. <laughs> such as uh, changing the toilet paper roll maybe or putting down the seat and um, when they do their laundry now she said that they tend to get the colors mixed up when do they do their laundry <laughs> okay you guys you don't you don't smell too bad but so we'll just move past that um, another thing that was said was uh, Robin Williams um, set himself on fire when he was at home now Personally, when my man is at home, I hope he's not wearing boobs. <laughs> and chances are he probably wouldn't be cooking, even if he was. Um, one of the other things that they said is, uh, we need men at home because they're handy. Well, are they really that handy? Let's take a look at Tim Allen. <laughs> Do you think his wife wants him at home fixing things all the time? Okay, yes, I'll take your first point. You are aware that Tim Allen is, like, fake, right? <laughs> Okay, Justin. <laughs> now let's move right along. Okay. Uh, I now want to cover some of the things that uh, my partner didn't quite get to cover when she was um, giving her speech because she ran out of time. Um, one of the things that she did go over a little bit, I'll just um, extend upon. And uh, we want men in the public eye. Ladies, can you really argue with this? Do we really want all those gorgeous guys at home doing their laundry? Or would we rather have them on the big screen so we can see them? I think so. Okay. Um, and another thing that my partner did not get to extend upon that I would like to touch on now just a little bit was um, we want to keep men in the workforce because they're lazy anyway. We want them out there. <laughs> Sorry guys, I had to say it. We want them out there bringing in money so they can buy us so uh, diamonds and take us out to dinner since... <laughs> want them to buy us stuff? Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Ladies, raise your hand if you don't want a diamond on your finger. Come on. I see two of you. <laughs> okay, and um, I'm almost done. <laughs> Bear with me, I'm almost done. Okay, um, the last thing I'm going to say before I go to sit down is um, just I want to touch upon Justin's philosophy. Masculinism. <laughs> Um, one of the things that he said is masculinism is important because um, it's now the man's turn to complain. We want to like, we want to give them something to complain about. We don't want them to have anything else to complain about. Okay, so I think I'm probably just about out of time. And with that, thank you very much. I have a lot to cover, so let's go through this really quickly. Starting first with the government case, and essentially they said that when men are out of the home, they get in problems, and when men are in the homes, they do great things. And you know what? We've covered this back and forth a lot. And like once the thing they talked about, you know, Hillary Clinton, how she wouldn't raise taxes, and how Bill Clinton has done a lot of bad, nasty things. But they never touched on the fact that if Bill was to stay home, he might be doing even more bad things, especially if Hill was in the Oval Office. How many interns can he bring home while she's busy working? <laughs> now going on. Jumping really quickly down into how men could do good things. I'm going to cover masculinism first, which is kind of odd that Justin wouldn't come up with the term that had masculinity as a root. <laughs> no offense, Justin. I owe him one low blow every time we debate. And how, like my partner said, men complain about a lot of things. You never see a man that could actually go through childbirth because they stub their toe and they're bitching. <laughs> so you want them complaining now about more things about what we have to go through? I don't think so. And then we go on, we look at this idea, and my partner brought up Tim Allen, and Justin said, well, he's a fake. 
Well, then again, so is the Scarlet Letter. Then again, we look at all the novelists that they brought up. They're fakes, but they're good examples. Look at Mrs. Doubtfire, who's their own example, who's a fake, who said her his, here's his boobs on fire, <laughs> who had to go and have food sent in because he couldn't cook. Clearly, we can see that there's a problem there. Going to their third point, they talked about how women do good outside. We brought up the Spice Girls. Look at me. Do you guys really want me out there in the public? Or do you want me locked up at home? I don't think that Justin or Carlo will debate on this one. <laughs> and they're looking at our points once again. We want men in the public eye. Do we want them nice and small? Or do we want to see a big, huge version of them? I mean, just look at Jimmy Smith's butt that we got to see in City of Angels. Hello, really? OK, maybe that's just me on that one. <laughs> we'll ignore that. And then clearly looking at the idea that my partner brought up is that men are lazy, let's keep them busy. Behind every great man, there's a great woman pushing them along. So clearly when we have women that are in the background, we do a lot of work from behind the closed doors. And for that, that's why we beg to oppose. <laughs> Carlo Pegvioli, <laughs> <laughs> conclude his, his debate for a speech no longer than three minutes. Here, here. Go, Carlo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You look absolutely ravishing this evening. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, it is my job now to do what we like to call crystallization. No, this is not a chemistry class. It's just another example of science, uh, social sciences and humanities ripping off the real sciences for terminology. <laughs> What I'd like to do then is basically give you some kind of significance to put this whole thing in perspective. I'm going to show you what the opposition has given us here this evening and then I'd like to show you what we as the government are offering you and we believe what the government is offering you is longer, bigger, heavier and much more deadly. <laughs> So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, on our issue of men as problems outside of the home, the opposition has talked about toilet paper. And I respectfully posit that toilet paper is a very thin argument. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the government is giving you major social significance here, talking about sex outside of marriage and the priesthood and the ministerhood, which is a big bad thing. We know we've heard enough about that lately. We're giving you the idea of men having caused all these wars, and Justin adds the notion of men having caused crime. You've got toilet paper over here, sex, war, crime. <laughs> I think we're showing you some social significance. So then moving into the second major issue that men do good at home. Once again, their major argument here is that Mrs. Doubtfire set her fake breasts on fire in the movie. Ladies and gentlemen, Robin Williams would never have had that problem had he been able to act like a man and not having to have hidden himself as a woman. That is a simply a practical issue here which they are not addressing. So they're talking about flaming breasts. I can't believe I'm saying that. It's speech night in front of 950 people. <laughs> And we're talking about all these wonderful things that the man can do at home. We're talking about this old house. They build a house every month, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies, gentlemen, do you not want that kind of productivity at home from your men? And when we look at Bob Dole, all these wonderful things that he can now do at home, women are able to benefit from this. It's not just men of any age who are able to benefit from Viagra. This appeals to all human beings. <laughs> Once again, we're talking about... Mrs. Doubtfire and the extra appendages of flame versus this old house, Bob Dole, Viagra, and lots of other things. The scales are tipping in our favor, we posit. Finally then, under our third major issue that women do good outside of the home, they've simply pointed out that men move in. Well, let's face it, lots of men don't have to be moving in when they're doing these other things outside of the home. The men are living outside building this old house. How do you think they get that done in a month? It's simply not possible. So they're talking about the trauma of men moving in and I guess not putting the toilet seat down. And we've shown you all these major significances, significances about women doing good outside of the home. We've shown you Margaret Thatcher. We've shown you Mrs. Dole, Jane Austen, and Ms. Spears. I really resent that remark about literature being fake. I would like to contend that literature is simply representative of the human condition and that would be a good argument. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, as the scales tip again in our favor, we look to the White House situation. We look at all the bad, bad things that have been going on. And Mr. Speaker, I think you have to call me by my real name and then maybe I'll sit down here. We look at the major... <laughs> 
We look at the major issues, ladies and gentlemen, and we simply would like to leave you with this one thought. Had Bill been at home, had Hillary been in the White House, would Monica ever have been on all those covers throughout 1998? We simply posit life in the United States of America would have been better had Bill stayed home and Monica stayed off the cover of every single magazine in the United States of America. Thank you very much. And for that, for the final time, we beg to propose. Thank you and good night. Well, that's all, folks. Thank you very much for your time this evening. We hope you enjoyed yourself and drive carefully.